What up, everyone? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Auto Tempest. Look, if you are looking for a car, whether you're trying to buy it or sell it, you need to know the market. And the best place to get the gauge of the whole market is autotempest.com. Why? Because all you have to do is put your search terms in one time, and Auto Tempest searches the entire internet. Cars.com, CarSoup, Cars Direct, not to mention Auto Trader, Craigslist, eBay, and Facebook Marketplace. Auto Tempest, and bring a trailer. Now that I mention it, bring a trailer as well. Auto Tempest searches all of it, you guys. Typing in search terms over and over is a thing of the past. Autotempest.com is here for you. They've been with us forever. We appreciate them, and they fund a bunch of other cool content around the YouTube space. So use Autotempest.com when you're searching for your next new car. We're also brought to you by Dylan Optics Sunglasses. You know those awesome sunglasses that I am wearing in every video? Sometimes it's like plastic frames, sometimes it's more aviator style, sometimes it's like the wraparounds, always with the matte finish lenses. That's Dylan Optics Sunglasses, guys. The NIR lens technology means that your eyes are protected from harmful UV rays. They're polarized. It makes it really, really easy to see, even after a long day in the sun. They're easy to clean, and they last a long time. They're they're pretty tough. I, I beat mine up pretty bad. That's not to say I haven't damaged them. I have, but <laughs> I treat mine pretty badly, and they take a beating, and they're, they're really, really good glasses. So if you go to our website, thesmokingtire.com, you click on that partners tab and there's Dylan Optics. If you use that link, we will send you a free t-shirt, Smoking Tire t-shirt, for every frame you purchase at uh, thesmokingtire.com under the partners tab. Dylan Optics sunglasses. All right, folks, this episode should be pretty cool. Really interesting conversation with a really interesting guy. Kevin Zinger uh, is an entrepreneur. Uh, He is an automaker. He's a technology guy. He kind of does a little of everything, but his car um, is basically 3D printed, which is really, really cool. So we're talking about that, but we're also talking about um, the total uh, environmental cost of cars. It's a really, really interesting conversation. I don't want to get too far into the intro. Just get into the conversation. Kevin Zinger of Zinger Automotive. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. Start of a new week. Um, We're stacking them deep because we got the Zoom thing going on. And well, fairly open schedules and also um you know within a couple of weeks zach and i are going to be moving to the new studio and so there may be a couple of weeks where we don't have a functional studio and so uh by getting ahead a little bit um we're gonna we're gonna handle that situation logistically a little better so the content river keeps on flowing even while we are uh loading gear into u-hauls and moving across the street uh that being said welcome to the show today we have a special guest, uh, Mr. Kevin Zinger of Zinger. And uh, just like he told me earlier, like Czar, like the Czar of Russia, CZ mean, is pronounced Z. Welcome, sir. Thanks. Hey, hey Matt. Hey, ha- smoking tires people out there. How's it, yeah, nice uh, how's it going uh, on your half of Los Angeles? Well, I mean, it's, it's a very nice evening turning into twilight, and it's beautiful around my home. Uh, and uh, it's a pretty typical work day. I'd say on the engineering side that uh, we're having very productive uh, days through our VPN network and uh, the factory is less productive because we have a, a small crew there. Uh, we're, we're mainly doing uh, to support the local medical community and also in, in Texas where we're manufacturing PP uh, equipment, you know, face shields and masks and, and uh related uh, PPE equipment using our uh, plastic uh, 3D printing equipment. So there's a, a skeleton crew there, but that's that's how it's going. So you uh, you you got a couple of companies going on and they're, they're intertwined. Uh, I learned about Divergent, which is the 3D printing company, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I had some conversations with one of your people about trying to drive something called the Blade which I yes. would still love to drive if it still exists somewhere. Um, and then now we've got the Singer uh, car, which is a different thing, a new thing. So tell me how all this works, Kevin. 
Well, uh, the way that it all works is that, uh, you know, having uh, co-founded a, a car company and co-founded uh, an EV battery company and having grown up in Cleveland with two older brothers as car mechanics, uh, most of my life has been fixated on cars and building cars and thinking about cars. And you know, one thing you very quickly learn is that when you're going to uh, design a car and build a car, you know, the biggest issue is turning those ideas and that engineering know-how into an actual physical structure that is the car, right? Yeah, harder than and, it looks, as they say. Yes. So, you know, you look, for example, uh, you know, you go to build, uh, uh, you know, an EV and you're even converting uh, a car into an EV that's an existing internal combustion engine car. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was running an EV company, I ended up spending more on uh, just retooling the body to convert it to an, uh, to an EV from an internal combustion engine car, like about $200 million. And that's over in China where it, it is as cheap as it can be. More on that than I spent on building, first designing really the first prismatic uh, automotive grade battery cell module pack thermal management, battery management system, and then a, a million square foot uh, uh, mega factory, which opened in 2010 in Tianjin. I spent more money on retooling that car than all of that technology development. And I looked at it and said, this is what is broken in this industry. This is what is actually truly broken. Uh, is, is, when you say this, do you mean literally the trying to re-engineer uh, existing models for EV? Do you mean um, the, the slowness of that process or do you mean the lack of 3D printing? What specifically? I mean, taking an idea, a design, engineering that, then having to go through a process of tooling, mm. meaning you have to design and build a tool. Right. Then you have to either stamp or cast something, and then you finally have a something. And that's over a very long cycle. You know, the shortest for a smaller component is probably six months or so. Uh, you know, the longest to tool up a car is 12 months or so. And then if you go to iterate that, then you're throwing away millions of dollars of tools and remachining a tool to stamp or recast something. So your ideas are, are always needing to be frozen in some very expensive, uh, uh, basically cookie cutter that allows you to manufacture that part, right? right I mean, it's yeah. the exact opposite of digital flexibility, right? We sit down and we used to have these things called printing presses and these printing presses used to have type I mean, the auto manufacturing is like having a huge expensive printing press that can only print one book. It's like has the type welded to it, right? Yeah. And that's the exact opposite of flexible, creative, and innovative, right? So you look and you go, okay, how, how in, the, in a digital world where I now have high performance computing and AI and new materials and potentially additive manufacturing, 3D printing, and new ways to assemble. Why haven't we used any of those tools? Why haven't why haven't we combined those into the industrial version of Mac desktop publishing, where you move away from that big printing press machine, yeah, and you move to something that doesn't care whether it's printing a Bible or a comic book or War and Peace. Right? You, yeah, that you got the same software and hardware. You send some data in something, mm -hmm. you know, you know the the data you know, reflects the output, doesn't change the machine at all. Oh, that was what I was going to ask. I was going to ask if, you know, obviously a 3D printer could print anything, but do you use a variety of somewhat specialized 3D printers? Well, or is it I, literally I say, you could use one printer and make a whole car with yet with enough software? Here's what I would say, which is the issue with 3D printing metals, alloys, is the commercially available printers are way too slow and the commercially available materials do not allow you to uh, print uh, 
components, say suspension structures or the actual chassis safety performance structure of the vehicle, uh, you know, those materials don't allow you to uh, to print those structures so that they'll actually meet performance requirements. So they'll actually have the strength and durability mm. or say in the crash area of the vehicle, yeah. have the utility, you know, have the ability to absorb energy. None of that exists. Right. So you could or, print a concept that, that, car, Here's but... what I will say. None of it existed until we invented a whole series of things in 400 plus patent filings now over the last five years. So we actually do have the Mac, uh, uh, industrialized Mac desktop publishing system, but it's our patented materials, a machine that we did the specification for, which all of these things are, are interdependent. You need a machine that uh, is able to print the materials that you want to generate at a certain cost point. And those materials in turn need to uh, say when they're you know, using uh, uh, laser melting to create the, the material layers, they have to have the right morphology and the right uh, makeup so that they can absorb energy and have the right part density. So all of these things, many, many, many thousands of things are interrelated. And what hadn't happened prior to our doing, as far as I know, uh, and I know a bit, uh, none of that was done as an integrated system. Everyone was looking and saying, oh, 3D printing, yes, we can use any material and we can do anything. And when you try to do everything, you can't really do anything well. <laughs> yeah. You have to purpose build and architect a system. Uh -huh. right? And that's what we did. And then in the end, when you do that, and the system has to have an economic purpose, it has to be able to have materials that, so for example, here, I'll give you one example, and then I'll shut up for a bit, which is. That's okay. I'm interested. I'm interested. You can go on for an hour and a half. If you like, I'm interested in this. This is cool. My, my wife's always complaining. I'm going on too long. So mad. Not, not that I, it's not okay. that I want to put you in a position. The audience wife, is tired please, of hearing me please anyway. Please step in whenever you want, but. Hey, so, you know, what, one thing is, you know, you look and say, hey, I, I need a printable material that has enough ductility so that in a crash, it's going to absorb energy. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be brittle and crumble, right? Which is what the standard materials that are available for, say, aluminum structures with uh, 3D printing, you know, that's, that's what the standard structures will do. They'll just crumble, right? So you look and you go, okay, what's available? And say you look to the aerospace industry and... For example, Airbus has a material that's called scalmaloy, but it has scandium in it, which is a super expensive material, right? So you look and go, oh, that's great, but it's completely unaffordable to do anything for mass production. So what do we have to Whoa, do? We have that to have a like material. That? Scandium? That's awesome. Scalmaloy yeah, it's printing. Scalmaloy, scalmaloy. scalmaloy from Airbus, but it's $300 plus a kilogram for oh. the overall material. Yeah, you know, because okay. <laughs> right, so it's you know, as an alloy, you don't want to print with something like that if you're doing mass production, right? But if you're looking at cars, you go, hey, I want to do something that is going to have the right ductility and still be printable, and so you need to bring in you know a team of PhD material scientists and do a whole huge amount of uh, materials development printing on a machine that's designed to print that type of material, testing of that material, refining of it, and do that materials development for automotive. And that allows you to take something that has scandium in it to something that doesn't have any expensive element in it and outperforms that alloy, that scalmaloy, in terms of ductility. And the price is, say, tw under $20 a kilogram instead of over $300 a kilogram. Oh, wow. And that's when you that's when you have something that's usable, but you can't do that unless you you are looking at a problem from a system level, meaning as an e economic and technology problem that are interwoven, and then you're designing a system that meets both the economic requirements and those performance requirements and the volume scalability uh, requirements. And in the case of automotive, obviously the quality requirements. Yeah, well, it it also depends, I guess, what kind of car you want to build. I mean, if you want to 
you know, if you want to build a $2 million car, I suppose you have a little more flexibility than if you're trying to build a $50,000 car, right? Absolutely. And and you'll use, say, in, in uh, the 21C car that we have, you know, we're using Inconol, we're using uh, titanium, we're using a number of uh, exotic expensive materials that we print with. But yeah. my, my idea, and, and it's just going back because you had asked me about the origin of of what this all is. I mean, the origin of it is how do you really, if you look at this world, you know, in a world where, uh, you know, in order to build a car company, look, you know, Tesla has spent 20 billion plus to what, you know, manufacture 400,000 vehicles last year. It is enormously expensive to try to create a new car company, right? Yes. I mean, $20 billion to manufacture 400,000 vehicles is a lot of money, right? Uh, it, I, so uh, if you, it is if you say it is. I, I I haven't done the math on it, but I mean I know if you just think about twenty billion dollars in general, it's uh it's a lot of money. Right. But I mean I don't know. Do they? So it I is if you're not said, making any back. Either you, either you need huge government subsidies, you know, uh-huh. or you've hit the nail on the head. Under, <laughs> you know, whether you're Hyundai, Kia, Toyota, either you've existed for a long time so that you already have, you know, some bank credit so that you have you know, uh, uh, access to capital, Yeah, you know, or you need some massive subsidy to get started. Right. right. And, and by the way, I, you know, obviously Elon Musk is a brilliant marketing guy and created a new brand. Right. But he, they also accessed an enormous amount of capital and you know, that, uh, you know, that's why the company survived and, and now, uh, prospers. But I looked at that and said, well, you know what? Kevin, think think like a hot router, right? I mean, who who do you really want to build? You know, wh- why do you want to build a Mac desktop publishing machine? You want to build it so that not only can small teams create something as cool as the twenty one C, but they could also build all kinds of different cars. And that meant that fundamentally, you needed to have a base set of alloys that could create affordable things, mm-hmm. as well as extraordinary things with you know expensive exotic uh, materials like the 21c yeah well I, I can see the marketing side of it where if you want to make a splash you start you know you build something crazy and then work your way down if you if you brought out a hatchback i think that would actually be a, a harder uphill battle sure I, I think it you know and even beyond that i think what you really what you really want to do when you're testing materials and you're creating things you want to have something that's really the ultimate expression of human imagination, right? For sure. And and show that the technology can do it. So here, imagine imagine this, and obviously, you know, you're you're welcome to come on, come uh, again, visit us anytime, and and see this in in action. I I would like to. I haven't. Zach uh, Zach went with uh, part of another job. He, Zach ha- Zach has two jobs. We all have several jobs, and he came to visit you guys as part of a television shoot he was working on. I wasn't part of that. I I'd love to come check it out. I know you're not far away from us. Um, sure. It certainly seems very interesting. I mean, I love the idea of using additive manufacturing to make shapes that you can't make. Um, any other way really uh or any other reasonable kind of way uh, i'm in i'm like a watch nerd and we're starting sure. to see that with with watch parts as well um although they certainly don't have the um you know they don't crash right, test they don't watches but right. yeah they don't crash test watches but it's still a very interesting thing because we're looking at uh looks like a suspension component of some kind some fucking alien thing on the screen right now um but it's I, I, it's a really cool idea. The question for that I have for you is: Do you want to build a car, be a car builder? Do you want to be a, an inventor? Do you want to be uh, someone who licenses a, a technology licensor? What what is your goal with all this? Because you got so many things going on. Well, we uh, uh, really have two things going on, right? What one is. <laughs> You're creating, you're thinking, how do you unleash, really unleash human imagination? For example, high performance computing now, look at the video games that it allows you to create. Yeah. Right? The small team create. But that's, you know, that's on a screen or on VR. How do you use that, you know, generative design, AI, 
high performance computing connected to additive manufacturing, or you, you want to call it 3D printing. Uh, obviously, there are a range of different technologies. How do you connect those together to unleash human creativity, right? And when you're looking at that, in order to do it, you actually have to create a system and start to build things. So that industrialized Mac desktop publishing system I'm talking about, you then have to make things. And when you make things, you want to make things that express the ultimate in your thinking and what you can make. And so these things are actually completely intertwined, these two different things. The divergent technology that we have over 400 uh, uh, patents filed, the uh, foundational patents all issued around, you know, everything from the system level patent to all of the gating technology patents across, uh, you know, completely new novel materials, machines, machine hardware and software, multi-material uh, structures, uh, optics and software relating to uh, automation and, uh, and robotics. Uh, all of those things are combined into one system and all have their own set of patents. And probably for the first, you know, tens of patents, I was a, a lead inventor. So, uh, you know, I, I know what that's about now that we're, uh, uh, you know, moving forward. Obviously, I have a bunch of tech domain experts that, uh, you know, are solving problems, generating uh generating ID, uh, IP, generating patents. But the idea is if you're creating a machine and you own that machine, then you want to create the coolest stuff and present that to the world. And what you want to do is say, hey, look, this is really cool stuff that's getting created. You can do it too. License it. Here are the enormous economic and creative and environmental advantages of licensing and using this technology to create vehicles. And here's like a crazy off the hook example of the tool creators using these tools to create the most off the hook stuff that they can mm. and brand it and sell it. Do you see, uh, I mean, I, can, I, I imagine you must see opportunity in the fact that you could basically build a car factory anywhere. Right. Yes, like you course, want, like yes. you could build a car factory in like sub-Saharan Africa and like six dudes could build cars there. Right. I wouldn't say six. I mean, yeah. Say, well, yeah say, like, here, here's, here's, a, here's an idea, Matt. Yeah. Could, could, could within the next 10 years, would it be totally possible that you had in every major like uh, mega city in Africa, maybe 20, 30, 40 modular uh, factories that are non-design specific. So, you know, imagine you have a GUI, a database, a material set, uh, you know, a printer farm and an assembly farm because these uh, these vehicle structures are automatically assembled, right? Are they? They, have the, they have the assembly features designed in them. So literally, you know, a, a you know, 20 by 20, uh, square foot vertical cell, uh, you know, 20 by 20 square vertical cell will assemble 10,000 vehicles a year. Vehicle structures do the body assembly of, right? Wow. You could have, you could have that industrialized Mac desktop publishing system yeah. in all of those places. They could do localized manufacturing for their area and the hardware and the software would never change whether they were doing a, you know, two seat EV or an SUV or a pickup truck. So when you said a minute ago that the assembly is built into the printing program, do you literally into mean part. into the part? So, so like, it's like, it comes out, it goes on, it comes out, it goes on, it comes out, it goes on. And, and like, does it, is a human involved in that process at all? Imagine, you know, and I'm super simplifying. Yeah. Because there are a bunch of process steps. But imagine you generate data. Mm -hmm. that, gen that data has all of your load cases looped in it. So you take all the physics models, whether it's, you know, crash or thermal or, uh, 
uh, durability, like a you know encode for durability or LS9 or ADOS for uh, for crash, and it's looped in all of your physics models. It's optimized the structure, so it's taking a material that's designed for a purpose, only putting it where it's needed. Yeah. So it's as light a structure, as efficient a structure as possibly can be made for a set of requirements. Sends that to a printer. The printer prints it. It comes out of that printer. It gets put on, uh, you know, uh, an AGV, a mobile parts table, uh-huh. a robotic mobile parts table. That parts table moves to a cell, and you know, the cell itself is being told with a message, you're about to assemble subframe XYZ. Here is the assembly sequence uh, of it. And uh, you know, here is, is the tool path that all of the robots need to follow. And we're not using conventional uh, uh, robotic technology either for doing this, but imagine then that the various parts and pieces have features that allow them to come together like, uh, you know, customized Lego pieces. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's pretty awesome. That's pretty cool. I am definitely on board with this. This sounds like a lot. Hey, come of, check it out. Come it's, check this it sounds out. like literally endless possibilities. I'm a fan of this. Let's talk about the 21 C the car. Sure. Okay. So now, now that we, you kind of understand the ethos and how this stuff is made, you have made this, crazy looking car how because i remember seeing the blade i think jig is the 21c related at all to the blade they had a similar look well you know the the 21 the the blade is sort of uh you know if you if you go back uh you know the the porsches that you see today there was actually an aero car from like the 1930s that uh Ferdinand Porsche built, right? Yeah, the yeah, and, I and it was the, sort of the first very raw prototype. Yeah. Well, the 21C I'd say is like iterated version 100 of what that is. Okay. I can is that so can the, you remind the technology, me technology everything divergent blade massively this changed. That? Oh, that's right? the blade. Mm-hmm. Okay. Can you can you go from blade to 21C? Is this I just want to see the styling changes to see if I could it, what the difference is. So that's the blade, and let me. Uh, and, and that's twenty one C there. That's okay, kind of yeah. Far off shot. The, I mean, the twenty one C is like every single piece of it is designed to fit with every single other piece of it. It's a much wider, longer uh, vehicle. Mm-hmm. You know that uh, that has a powertrain we designed and built ourselves, and uh, basically that 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 is what can happen when every piece of the vehicle can be imagined and put together. So, you know, you achieve, you know, the, the, you know, the Holy grail of uh, engineering and design, which is the sum of the parts is greater than the individual parts themselves. And that's what it is. It seems like the, the, the blade was the first, kind of idea and you're like okay let's have the, the cockpit in pass or the pa- driver and passenger in line and then you can have this shape because of that layout but then the 21 is just the next step, like a big step forward you know because you made it what when did you start designing the 21 versus the blade like how many years between the two i mean there were a, there were a couple years and a lot of technology development right? so, yeah I, you know, I was that the the blade I did when I was first inventing, and I built a single vehicle, right? And I I was myself the only employee, so that's <laughs> that that is uh, you know that's uh, you know Kevin Zinger coming out of the garage in 2015, you know, and the blade is you know 2020, many 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 iterations forward. So right. the twenty one C one's got, like yeah. a stick figure and the other is you know total badass technology. So you've got driver in, uh, and passenger in line. You've got it's it's electric. Uh give me some stats on this thing. No, it's a hybrid. It's a strong hybrid. Oh, it's hybrid. hybrid. Oh, okay, excuse me. My bad. My bad. Uh give me uh yeah. give me some stats. So, you know, it has two electric motors, uh you know, one for each wheel up front 
and uh, there's no drive shaft, uh, and there's a mid-engine internal combustion engine, uh, you know, that puts out uh, about 950 horsepower. You know, it depends on what what uh, you know what boost you have. Uh, you know, relatively uh, modest uh, boost. You're going to put out you know 930 to 950 horsepower at about uh, 10,500 RPM. It's got a red line at around 11,000. It's a 2.88 liter uh, V8 that we designed. Uh, as I said, it has two uh, uh, turbochargers. You know, we, we designed all of the pieces around it, the uh, thermal management uh, of it. Yeah, and there, there you go. So you put those together and, you know, 1250 you've got a, a 1250 horsepower, horsepower 10, vehicle with, wow. you know, 2,600 pound dry weight, uh, you know, coming out of a corner, obviously that's when, or accelerating a car, that's when you want the front wheel drive. Yeah, no so we kidding. have, we have uh, you know, because you need more tire surface area, right, at, at the lower speed to accelerate. I mean, you can't, you know, there, there's no tires out there where you can really, you know, 1200. Use. No, not. No, there aren't. <laughs> no, no, I was just saying, even for the 930 horsepower, you know, mid engine for the rear wheels, you know, they, they run the, you know, the, the uh, mid engine internal combustion engine uh, uh, drives the rear wheels through a, a seven speed uh, sequential gearbox. Uh, also that we uh, designed. You guys so that, made that drives the rear wheels and then the front wheels when it's needed for acceleration, uh, those are electric. And we have, you know, torque vectoring uh, of the uh, of the front wheels. So this is, you know, torque vectoring, all wheel drive when you need it coming out of corners, accelerating, you know, zero to a hundred kilometers an hour in under two second, uh, you know, eight second uh, quarter mile et car you know this is yikes and you know, so there and so is, you, is, you guys designed you new, the right? seven speed me, uh, sequential gearbox sorry pardon I, I didn't hear you said did you said you designed the gearbox in house as well yeah we designed i mean we didn't manufacture the gearbox itself it was manufactured by uh hewlin for oh, us oh it's hewlin yeah so it's a it's a proper sequential yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, does it use a clutch pedal? Uh, clutchless gearbox, clutchless seven speed. Is it a, is it a uh, dual a dual clutch? So we, we did we did a design and a set of requirements, uh -huh. and Hewlin built it for us. Oh, so it's yeah. basically like Hewlin basically builds race gearboxes. So that's pretty much. Sure. <laughs> is it? So there, there uh, are two you versions. Yeah. One one for the track vehicle doesn't you know it's just ha has uh, dog gears in it. Uh huh. It's, it's loud, but you know I don't care. I like raw cars, right? I like raw. You know I I built. I build cars and I just lo love them stripped down and I don't care if they're loud and the, the track car, the track version of the car, the track kit has uh, uh, a gearbox that just has the dog gears, no synchros. And then there's a, a, a road version, uh, a street version that has a uh, synchros in the gearbox, but both, both uh, manufactured by Hewlett. What are some of the other differences between the track car and the street car? You know, different arrow. Obviously, you need a lot of uh, uh, downforce. There's, uh, uh, you know, a rear wing, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, dive planes on the vehicle. Uh -huh. and just the front and rear splitter uh, are different. Uh, uh, there's a rear seat uh, delete and some other light weighting uh, 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 to the vehicle. Now, let me yeah. ask you about this twin turbo V8. Uh, I mean, uh, from 2.88 liters to get 950 horsepower is extremely intense. Uh, yeah. And obviously, you need the revs to get there. At yeah. a more modest rev that a more modest manufacturer might consider their red line, call it 7,000, does it make similar power to the... Um, to like a high performance germ, like the four liters that they're using in at in the AMG cars and stuff like that. Is it like in the sixes at around seven, and, and you just make that rest of that power just through pure revs? You know, I, I'd say the you know the the torque and the power curve are pretty flat toward the top, but you know I, I was looking for a car that that had the sound and excitement of an early two thousands Formula One car. You know, back when they had the cars that could rev, you know, well into the teens and, you know, have it so that it would be uh, durable enough for the road and the hold up for somebody who's, you know, not a professional driver. 
uh, you know, on the track who wanted to have a road track car. And obviously if they want to have it professionally driven, it can be driven, you know, very, very fast, you know, a, you know, track record beating production car. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, Hey, you know, you only have one life to live. Matt. Yeah, no, I no. Look, I'm not that criticizing. Sound. <laughs> I'm not I criticizing love the sound. I'm just of, wondering. Uh, those four of and you know what? I don't have to build this car to any regulations. I don't have to follow somebody's, you know, aero rules or any of the rules. You know, any of these different FIA rules. So you look at this and go, you know what? If you're going to be a total rule breaker, and you want to do something cool look at every single piece of it and even if it's a marginal gain add the marginal gain and make it where you put all of those together and you have the ultimate cool car um speaking of rule you know you say rules and i understand your implication was rules for a racing series if i understood you correctly yeah. um what about rules uh for the road oh sure i mean you you, the, you know this is uh, set up to be fully homologated uh first in, in north america in the u.s and canada and then in uh the eu uh-huh you know, they're, they're basically the same homologation rules okay okay and what uh, I, I haven't seen a 21c in person and in the pictures that you have that zach's kind of scrolling through here they're sort of studio yeah. shots can you give me a sense of the size of the car like compared to another sports car that i might be f- more familiar with it's probably similar to a Corvette, but wider. Okay. Similar to the new mid-engine uh, Corvette, but wider. So be, even though you're sitting driver and passenger in a straight line, you, you the, the, the car itself does not get much narrower because of that, or at least the track width doesn't. No, I mean, the, the cockpit, you know, there's a cockpit which cuts down on, you know, the frontal surface area around uh, the driver and passenger, although there's actually a lot of room within the cockpit, uh, part of the car. Uh, but you know, if you're a driver and you love to drive or you're a go-kart, you know, you love go-karts, you love sort of down low high speed, uh, vehicles, right? Yeah. The most exciting position to be in. I mean, the driver position for a driver car, the ultimate position is to be in the center of the car. Oh, of right? course. Yeah, yeah, of course. And so then the question is, okay, you know, do you want to have a passenger or not? You know, I mean, the, you know, the old. Uh, no, yes, you do. You Ford definitely F1 want to have a passenger. was great with two passengers in the back, but I never got it because I would never think of driving something like this with more than one person, you know, with me going and doing something. And so I looked at that and said, you know, have, you know, minimize that frontal surface area, have the cockpit, have the driver sit in the middle. It's an ultimate driver's uh, car, you know, and then in terms of the track, I mean, th- this is meant to be driven really fast, you know, into curvy, high downforce tracks like uh, like Willow Springs and, mm. and like Laguna Seca. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so there, you know, you know, downforce, you know, downforce to lift. I mean, it, it's you know, it's much more important even than horsepower to have that downforce. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so the, the wider the track, uh, you know, the better the, you know, the airflow and aerodynamics and downforce that you're going to get right because you know you have that air trapped under the vehicle you know you have the 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 air washing out of the wheel wells you need to be able to channel all of that and have you know a wider vehicle you want you want to uh you know get more tired uh uh to the ground uh, especially if you're looking and going you know what I don't have to follow anybody's rules. This is like Can-Am from the 60s and early 70s, which was, that was always my favorite, you know, favorite racing series. Like the no rules, ultimate, go go for it totally, you know, uh, you know, McLaren's, you know, Jim Hall, you yeah. know, Chaparral's. Psycho death machines. Porsche, yeah. Porsche 917s, you know, uh, you know, Donahue's car, all of that, like, totally go for it and this is like totally go for it look at everything you can do put it into to one car and make it into like ultimate american driving machine is it possible um so you know you've got this hybrid system um and yeah. is that is, cool, huh? i don't i don't want to make i'm not making any assumptions anymore does it use batteries or does it use something else that's not batteries sure. <laughs> so because we're only using the front wheels to accelerate and in corners we have uh, two relatively small uh, 
uh, battery packs, each of which is only a couple kilowatt hours uh-huh. that, that drive uh, each of the front uh, motors. Those in turn, you know, there are two things. One, you know, you have uh, regenerative braking. So, you know, you're really just using the, the motors as a brake to, you know, turn into a generator and then put power back into the to the battery pack. Yeah, you know, with 950 motor. horsepower engine, you probably you probably barely have to touch the brakes in normal driving, right? You can probably just basically engine brake. Can you one foot drive it? Will it engine if you will it brake hard enough if you one foot if you just lift? Yeah, I mean it it, 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 it depends on how you set the regenerative braking, but yeah. Oh. And then the, the second thing is there's a rear generator that is that is tied to the crank of the the rear uh of the mid engine uh, uh, internal combustion engine uh-huh. and that that generator uh uh, recharges the front batteries as okay well, well that right? yeah that was my question so if you and go so, if you went out and did a half okay. hour track day it will it will generate enough juice that you're not going to exhaust the hybrid powertrain during a, a, a standard lapping session exactly so yeah. you here's the thing between the regenerative braking and having that rear generator on the internal combustion engine uh-huh you unlike an electric car where you're each lap you're losing a bunch of power right yeah and, and obviously generating massive heat. Uh, this is, you know, basically allowing you to have your full power for the entire uh, set of track yeah. laps because you're all you're using that rear generator. Yeah. You know, to always make sure that uh, you know you've that it's got, got full juice, power yeah. to those front uh, electric motors. The, uh, so that, the, that's, the that's the cool thing. Yeah. I the, mean, in that strong hybrid setup, you get the benefit of the. Uh, the front wheels being driven and, and, you know, with torque factoring plus driving the front wheels, you get that additional power pulling you out of the corner or accelerating you for zero to hundred kilometers or, uh, you know, for a quarter mile or zero to, to 400 to uh, kilometers an hour to, to zero. Yeah. And at the same time, you can keep it like super light by just having little uh, battery packs that you use a rear generator to uh, to recharge along with generative braking. Can it right? drive that on? That allows can, you to have a lighter uh, car that gives you all of the benefits of yeah. you know all wheel drive. Can it drive on EV only? Yeah, a little bit, but that's you know that's not the purpose. And then they, no, I was just curious. Thing, you know, the so there's, there do, might be some folks in Kensington who care about the London tax. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, you, throw, sure. you throw ten miles of EV in there, it saves them like hundred thousand dollars or whatever. You know? Yeah. Well, you know that, you know, that, you know, that. I mean, this is supposed to be the ultimate car. So, if, you know, as they say, if, you know, if you have to worry about uh, the Listen, upkeep of a yacht, people who probably, can afford the ultimate cars the yacht market, but you know, you know, they remember that song that says, Hey, you can't please everyone. So you've got to please yourself. Well, I'm just saying, man, there's people who have seven figure cars and register them shits in Montana. So I don't want to hear the if you can afford it, then blah, blah, blah. There's the richer you are, the cheaper you are. And if you could sell someone a car that's two million dollars, but you don't have to pay taxes on it in London, there there is a market for that. I'm just saying. You, you may be right, Matt. You may be right. You may be right. So, I, you know, they um, look up how many Paganis are registered in the state of Montana. It's like 12 and they have maybe like 2 million people in the whole state. It's, it's a little it's, silly. It's, it's very easy to register there. That's, <laughs> yes, that's one thing. it is. <laughs> they, they make it easy. They make it easy uh, um, and it gives them, gives them some, uh, gives so them some income for sure. What is, I mean, I know there's nothing like it, but, but what are some of the sensations like when driving something like the 21 C in anger? Well, uh, you know, imagine, uh, imagine you're like a, uh, a jet, uh, fighter pilot on a track Yeah. without wings, right? You just, <laughs> yeah. So it's like, it's like your fo- it's Forza in real you know, life. The- it's like crazy racing simulator speeds, but in real life is what you're talking about. Basically. Yeah. And yeah. Hey, you know, I mean, look, uh, I'm dating myself, but. You know, you look at things like, uh, you know, the inspiration for this, uh, you know, Top Gun, right? Or, you know, super bikes. I mean, being there, you know, not only being in the cockpit of a fighter, right? Uh, with a with a co-pilot, but being on a super bike with somebody on, on the back, 
right? I've been I've been on the back of a super bike with a MotoGP rider. It scared the shit out of me. I got to be honest. <laughs> but that's are you? That's what's cool. Yeah, no, for sure. I I look. I this is a special thing. I, I've driven all the newest, fastest, crazy stuff, and yep. frankly. The fact that you, a lot of what's available, it just takes like money to get it, and you know, there's, it's like I, you know, you get out of something like a McLaren 720s uh, or a Taycan uh, Turbo S Porsche or a, the new 4 GT or a Koenigsegg, and you go, or even a Hellcat, you know what I mean? Even even a Challenger Hellcat, and you go, Jesus, it just, it's just money. All you need to do is write a check, and you can have this like missile you know and and the kind of stats that you're talking about eight seconds in the quarter 1250 horsepower 2600 pounds i mean i drove a hennessy venom gt and say what you want to say about john hennessy that fucking thing was real <laughs> and i did zero to 216 seconds with a hoodie on without even trying and i was like okay i i now know what the fear is and i we now know what the end point is of tuner cars and i'm just like i'm actually scared of where this thing is gonna go you know you need to be i mean you need to know how to drive if you really want to push it right but um uh, i think i'm okay at that i think i'm all right at driving are these sure. can so, be honest are these so you just, I mean, photos you need, real you know, you, you, i mean to have fun you need i mean to really drive it as a performance car you, you need to go to a track i mean take it to a track and uh not even a track. You, you got to go to a know, big you track. You need to dude. get to know the car. You need to get to know the car on the track. And uh, like, if you took you this know, thing to thermal, that devil keeps tapping you on your shoulder until you go faster and faster and faster, and then yeah, and then you, happens, and then you and, sail it you know, off. The cliff. Hopefully, you just run it into the infield <laughs> or something, and you get back on. Right? Um, yeah, no. Look, it looks nuts. I mean, it's not. It's just. It's not even. You need a racetrack. You need a big racetrack. You need like Road America or something, you know, because there's a lot of these private racetracks. Like Thermal is not that big. Spring Mountain is a lovely place, but it's tight. There's nowhere to run a 1,200 horsepower car at Thermal. No, you need an F1 approved type track, <laughs> yeah. and it's like basically for no, any hyper, got, hyper car. I mean, like you've that. got a lot of downforce with, with this car and really good aero. I mean, this right, you wouldn't get out of second gear. Th in that this car is thermal. this is a down. You know, if, if you were looking, say, you know, I mean, at LMP1, people talk about. Uh, you know, downforce tracks and horsepower uh, you know, tracks. I mean, uh, you know, I'm. We're on the same page California. here, buddy. I love we California. Need a big I track. reading Hot Rod Magazine in Cleveland and thinking, some point in my life, I want to be in California. You, you look at that and you go, you know what? This thing is designed for downforce tracks. I no, well, that's exactly what I just said. Big tracks, same thing. Big track, downforce track, same thing. Uh, what's is it? Does it have any kind of uh, chill mode? How are the mannerisms when you get get stuck on the four hundred five and it's a hundred degrees? Is it all right? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, you know, the car has AC and it's been well designed, you know, to uh, uh, you know to cool down the the cabin. But you know, it, it's it's an extreme car. You know, the, not not for a second am I going to tell you this is like the car that you want to be sitting in traffic. <laughs> I mean, the, you know, the car the car itself will. You know, when you park it, it'll, you know, it'll turn into a transformer and crush you. You know, it'll be so pissed off. <laughs> I got you. And sitting, and sitting in traffic and not being driven, right? So right. Little, well, like, what, what are you doing to me? You know, you're, you're I like, feel you. That's you okay. <laughs> That's totally all right. I mean, not every, you know, the, I think there's something to be said for, for a car like that. And I think that the 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 standard issue off the rack supercars in the two to $400,000 range, they're all extremely nice and the performance is extraordinary, but they're very easy. They're not, it's, it's, it's almost not an occasion. You know, when we get them to test, we just use them as everyday cars and, and people buy these things and then they stick them away. And it's almost a shame because the company's gone so far out of their way to make that thing usable to go to the grocery store. And, you know, people are afraid to put miles on it. And so if you're going to have a special car, you know, make it give you a special experience, you know? Well, well I mean, this is, this is a very particular car. I mean, there are 80 cars that are going to be made. 80 of the 21C. And that's okay. It, right? How many and, have you made so far? Pardon? Have you built, have well, you built I mean, it? Not, 
I mean, that, uh, you know, we're, uh, I mean, the, the two cars that are, I mean, we've done a bunch of work that led up to this, but I mean, the, right now we built the, the first two cars and the one car is, you know, had, right before we were about to ship to Geneva, we were going to ship both cars. Oh yeah. You know, it had been through a couple of months of, uh, you know, of track driving to sort the car out. And, you know, then we were coming back and going into production. So we have to, you know, th those were really the first track and first road car uh, models that were built before we go, were going into production. The uh, image I mean, that, you know, our business, our business itself is obviously we have a, you know, a different, much larger business where we work for, uh, you know, two of the top five global OEMs doing structures manufacturing that, we can't say anything about, but, you know, uh, uh, you know, this technology is going to be applied to mass production. I'm sure it will be. I'm curious, just the photo that Zach had pulled up there, the blue car. I, I, yeah, that's that, that's the track car. Right. Um, are, is that photo, are the doors open? Is that how the doors, oh, so do the track car yeah. not have windows? Pardon? Does the track car have, windows. Are, are the windows in the door? I just the windows are down. The windows oh, are all right. Windows sorry. I'm, I'm looking at a photo from like far away and the doors are, they're funky. They're uh, butterfly style doors. Um, yeah. But it just, from the angle I'm looking at, it, it almost doesn't look like a door could go, or a window could go in that door, but obviously it does. Oh, it's in. It's absolutely in there. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. All right. The doors are crazy no, long. You, you've got, uh, the door you've looks got electric, crazy long. You've got long. electric windows. They, they go up and down. Yeah. Yeah, because the door has to open to let both people out. Kind of, you know, it's one, oh, yeah. it's one door for it's one door for a front people. and a back seat. So oh, the door is crazy yeah. long. Oh yeah, how many different iterations of door design did you go through, Kevin? You know, we we actually got that right pretty quickly. But it, it is a very cool door, and to make it super lightweight, you know, you had to do a lot of optimization and design and three D printing. I mean, the the cool thing about this car is that. Uh, you really were able to unleash your imagination and things that, you know, normally you'd look and go, oh, we're, we're uh, you know, going to have to uh, design something a little bit uh, differently because of the way that you need to manufacture it. That didn't happen with any part of this car. I mean, yeah. we looked and, you know, being able to, you know, do full digital generation and printing and assembly of a structure just changes it, changes mm -hmm. everything, right? It completely unleashes uh, human freedom to create. Hmm. Uh, what oh, What about, oh, two questions. One, where do the rear passenger's feet go? Around or underneath the driver? Uh, they go to the side. Of to the, the side. Drive. Okay. Question number two, what parts in building a car can you just not make using your methods is it the interior is it what it what can what what requires input from somewhere else or a human or something well, well I, I i'd say here you, you know you could uh you know the the gearbox casing you can print today right mm -hmm. but you can't uh you know you can't print gears out of hardened steel you know and you know, put them through machining and everything else that mm -hmm. you need to do uh, right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, uh, you know, things, you know, things like, uh, uh, you know, internal combustion heads. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can do now. So the... Is your combustion engine built uh, using more traditional... I mean, it sounds like an extraordinary engine, but is it built using more traditional internal combustion technology? I mean, it, it's it's our design, and it has a bunch of three D printed parts. But uh -huh. obviously, like things like uh, pistons and crankshaft, and, and uh, uh, you know the the internals to the uh, to the engine, you know, are you know traditionally manufactured. Okay, cool. That sounds awesome, man. Yeah, it's just, it's just <laughs> the, really the other cool, cool thing that we do with it, you know, I, I don't know if you ever heard of this, Matt. It's kind of a cool thing. Uh, but, you know, uh, there are a bunch of companies around the world that are taking renewables and instead of using them uh, to store them in a battery for transportation, uh, there's 
uh, a way that, and it was actually uh, invented here at USC. Now it's being used in a, in a company Bill Gates has called Carbon Engineering. Uh, and then uh, another company called Carbon Recycling International in, uh, in, uh, in Europe, which is where I actually buy my fuel. But what they're doing is they're taking uh, renewables and they're using them to combine CO2 out of the atmosphere with hydrogen. And so instead of storing, uh, say, sun or wind or nuclear or hydro in a battery, they turn it into a liquid. It, it's methanol, right? Which is obviously racing fuel. So literally, when I run the car track, I, I, when I do it, I, you know, and I run it at, at the track, mm -hmm. I use I use this liquid that's called vulcanol. It's just racing methanol, but generated uh, generated completely renewably. Interesting. Uh, and so that car, as it's run, even though it has an internal combustion engine. It is a true zero zero emission vehicle. When, when you, you burn, burn that fuel, down. does it is it is like a fuel is the fuel a zero emission fuel because of its origin or is it just yeah. a it is really it is because what they're doing How is does that work. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what. Go and look up Carbon Recycling International on Wikipedia. Okay. Right, and it, it'll take you like two minutes to read it. Okay. Uh, but what they're doing is they're using a desiccant. They're using uh, an absorbent to absorb CO2 out of the atmosphere, but at an industrial scale. And then they're simply combining it. It's a relatively straightforward uh, chemical reaction. They're combining it uh, with hydrogen, and then you get the liquid. Because you're taking the CO2 out of the atmosphere, yeah. you're not adding any CO2 to the atmosphere. Oh, that okay. That makes sense. Right. So, okay. You know, so whatever you, know how, you yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know how say uh, uh, you know they they always go hey you know the the you know the perfect example of a sustainable ecosystem is you know a uh, you know a wildflower meadow because it's taking these different chemicals and elements nitrogen and phosphorus and CO two uh, and oxygen hydrogen and it's cycling them through the system. That's exactly what this is doing. Yeah, you know, I mean, that, I didn't, I didn't think about the the fact that you're pulling the CO two from the air, and therefore, when you put it back into the air at the other end of the car, it was already there. Yeah, and I'll tell you what the cool thing about it is: every single Everything. one of these gas pumps that we have in America could pump this stuff out if we wanted to do it. Every single one of our cars could easily. It's just like a flex fuel. Right? Really? It's nothing all. Nothing how all, fast? All doesn't matter. How fast can we make this shit? <laughs> can, we, can we just start well, cranking it? I mean, hydrogen is very me, abundant, right? If you ask me, it would be the single most important thing to do from uh, a sustainability standpoint. Yeah, I mean, and, and I mean, obviously, like, I mean, uh, with minimal modification, a regular internal combustion car can run on it, right? Yeah, and, and it was invented by a Nobel Prize winning chemist, this this whole About this. series of, of here at USC. I Margola. mean... Yeah, this this sounds like the kind of thing that like mobile will buy them out and shut them down or something. You know what I mean? Exxon yeah. Exxon Mobil wants no part of this. You would bet on that, wouldn't you? Yeah, and so what's the what is like the? Uh, it's got to be like one sixteen octane equivalent, right? It's pretty high octane stuff. Yeah, or you know, or more. I mean, if it, you just look at it at a knock basis, I mean, it's you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is this is pure. I mean, it's racing fuel. It's methanol, right? It's racing alcohol. It's wow. CH three O H racing alcohol. Is it is it expensive? You know, we're I think we're paying like eight nine dollars a, a gallon. But the the thing is, that's, that's just cheap. because it's that's, not that's at, cheap it's not for at that. scale. It's not at scale. Mm. If you look at methanol itself, that's produced by like uh, that's produced from uh, natural gas. It's like fifty cents a gallon right now, right? Yeah. So if we wanted to scale it up, all we'd need to do is, you know mix part uh, natural gas based methanol because I obviously we're producing a, a heck of a lot of natural gas in the US. We're, we're actually flaring most of it, just burning it off and wasting it. You can convert that to methanol, mix it with sustainable methanol, and then just keep increasing as you scale up. You know, it brings the price down and you just have more and more of the sustainable methanol mixed with the uh, nat gas based methanol. Oh, that's super interesting. That's, Look, there's actually that guy, George Ola, uh, on Wikipedia. It's called The Methanol Economy. Uh-huh. You know, 
I mean, he, he, it obviously would, you know, would be a super big real threat to, uh, you know, to uh, the oil and gas companies and to EVs. Right? Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, there it is. There you go. I, I noticed that you, I mean, other than uh, in the littlest bit that you need to contribute to the performance of the 21C, you're not really, uh, you're, you're not going for an EV at this time. It's like it would be the hot thing to do right now. But do you just, what kept you from doing a pure EV? Just wanting a Formula One car? I mean, there was no reason to do it for, a, you know, a car that you wanted to have as an ultimate performance car, right? I mean, you... Uh, Unless you're racing I mean, Pikes Peak, let, let's, yes. I mean, let's let's be real on physics and let's be technology agnostic. You know, some people are like, I'm an EV person, or you know, I'm a this person. I, I'm a no technology agnostic person. I mean, I I could care less what the technology is. I look at the result. Okay, right. That's a fair position. And so, I, and so I look and go, hey, can can you with you know the thermal, you know. Uh, uh, characteristics of a you know of a large ev car you know what size battery system how heavy how much does it consume resources how long is this thing going to last on a track driving it hard and if i can have a zero emission car on the track that's much lighter and faster and cooler why would i want to be sitting on top of a of a huge you know uh, you know, king size mattress format battery pack driving around a track. I mean, I don't think you personally would, but I could see why you, smart businessman, might want to market uh, the technology that that your your the rest of your technology as being associated with something that you don't have to explain to people why it's clean. You know what I mean? You well, I, I, you know what I think the coolest thing is to say, you know what, I, I, I'm. See this car here? It's got renewables stored in it. It's got renewables stored in a liquid. It's got liquid sunshine, liquid wind, liquid thermal. And you know what? It's a liquid that has 30 times the energy density of a battery. And I don't have to cart it around. Yeah. So why don't why don't I just put that old liquid sunshine in my tank? I think you are making a really good point. <laughs> I think you're making a really good point about it. Yeah. Okay. And I you guess I'm me. kind of like, uh, you know, grew up in Cleveland, scruffy, working class person who, you know, luckily was an all-American football player. So got, you know, <laughs> found my way to college. And, uh, you know, I'm at the point where, you know, I don't care about technologies. I don't care about what's in. I care about what works. And I see a brand here and the, the brand for Zinger and 21C is iconic design, which I think we have a super cool design. When people see this thing in reality, they just go, wow. And we're going to keep that design language on everything we do, right? It's built using a revolutionary technology, everything from materials to what prints it, to what assembles it, to the adhesives it uses, to all of the designs come from us. Right. Mm -hmm. So we created we created the tools to create our dream machine. It has dominating performance. You look at those specs, you get this thing on the track, you know it. And it's built using a sustainable system because the single biggest issue is not tailpipe exhaust. When you look, <laughs> you are doing extractive mining of a bunch of different materials. You're processing them. You're manufacturing it. And then if you manufacture something that's hugely material and energy consumptive, very heavy, then you have to, to manufacture fuel for it, whether it's electricity or something else, then you have to dispose of it. We're looking at it and saying, with a full real digital production system, just like nature, you know, nature, you look at a leaf or other things, it's only taking a material it chooses and putting it exactly where it's needed it's the most super material and energy efficient system imaginable evolution right we use high performance computing and other technologies to do the same thing but to expand man's creativity and doing it while at the same time creating that material and energy efficiency that's what's green that's what's sustainable 
And if you're looking at doing something, you want it small, light, having a, you know, four or five, 6,000 pound vehicle that has a big battery, you know, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, you can't create something sustainable that massively increases per vehicle, the amount of material and energy used, used to produce it, uh, you know, material that the is makes up the vehicle itself, then all of the supporting infrastructure that's needed, plus all of the energy that needs to be produced, you know, manufactured to operate it. Yeah, I, you know, we, you know, we live in LA and EVs are popular here. And I think sure. part of that in LA has to do with the experience of driving them, but also, you know, uh, people are conscious of smog and stuff here. And so the, the yep. tailpipe emissions are associated with local air quality. Uh, it's not, and I don't, and I think that, do you, well, question, the, do, I think that because I just built a building and I was dealing with power companies and stuff like that, I think it will be virtually impossible for the city to provide enough power for, you know, a huge percentage of people to be driving EVs full time. Do you agree with that? Well, what I'd say, Matt, is if you're going to do something like a Green New Deal, I mean, getting ser real serious for a moment. Yeah. You'd have to look up look at what are the inputs meaning you know how many new mines do you need for nickel cobalt lithium etc what's the infrastructure what do you need to do that how much power is needed and then go okay if you get what you want what does it actually look like what is it done to the planet and i think people would be absolutely shocked absolutely shocked because they would see you know, you're you're opening up many, many, many new mines, which in and of themselves were in one planet, right? This is like spaceship, uh, you know, planet Earth, right? Uh, you know, we've got one atmosphere. Uh, you know, something, you know, you, you may not feel something somewhere, but you're going to feel it sooner or later if it, coming from somewhere else, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, you look at this and the scale of all of these different things need to be uh, really looked at and analyzed. It's called life cycle analysis, meaning, you know, look at things from extracting mm. something to processing it, to manufacturing and manufacturing fuel, operating it, and then disposing. In that analysis, you have to also, just as you said, look at all of the infrastructure. How yeah, much I, more power I, is needed? How uh, many more new power stations? What are you replacing? What happens to it? What's the material and energy intensity? because the single most important thing is the consumption of material and energy. That's the single most important factor in sustainability, not tailpipe exhaust. And we better look at that up front and actually do our homework, and we're not. And you know why? Because we're not tech agnostic and we're not brand agnostic. You know, we all have the things that we love and wanna bet on, and instead of thinking clearly, <laughs> you know, we let people take us for a ride. I agree with you. I actually, you know, I, I've been making the, I'm not, I'm not really a science person, but I'm kind of, I feel like I have, uh, I don't know, a sense of, a sense of a, of a bigger picture. And I, I've said that the cleanest thing you could do as the consumer of cars would be to buy a lightly used and well cared for relatively you know, relatively clean car, not some giant truck and, and keep a car that's already here as clean as it can be and on the road for as long as it can be because making another car to replace it and disposing of this one is dirtier than just keeping this one going unless it's like a horribly dirty car. Is that, is there some truth in that you think? You're absolutely correct. 100% Correct. I don't know. Do, do, do you know what Goldman Sachs is? You must, right? It's investment bank. Yes. So uh, Goldman Sachs in uh, December of 2019, December 5th, 2019, put out a research report, right? And the research report was called New Era in CO2 Regulation, EVs to be tested across life cycle, not only on running performance, oh, right? Yeah. And you know why? Because 
and it, and it may be to like you know the you know sort of billionaire green tech set you know probably has their hair standing on end uh, but what this basically says is unless you've got like a very small light EV that has about a 150 mile range once you get above that uh, it's no better than the average internal combustion engine vehicle being operated in the uh, in the EP EU in the European community uh, and you know, when you look at what that vehicle is, right, it's like a 60 kilowatt hour vehicle uh -huh. that, that breaks even with the average internal combustion engine car, right? The average, not with a hybrid, not with a high, with the average, yeah. the complete average, right? And the average is probably like a, cross, like a crossover you, you know with you know a V6. What, you know what com car companies are putting out? Yeah, like 100. 100 kilowatt hour. Who's got a 200? You know what, that, you know what that's like? <laughs> That's like you're driving three internal combustion engine vehicles at the same time. <laughs> Who's got huh. a 200? I haven't heard of a 200 kilowatt hour. Who's got that? It's called the Cadillac Escalade. Oh. 2021. And you know what? And, and you know, I don't know what what's Rivian have. I think they have. I think their their low end model is 150 kilowatt hour. 2021 Cadillac Escalade. Oh my God, a 400 mile range EV Escalade. Jesus. Oh, there it says 200 kilowatt hour. Yeah, battery. yeah, yeah. I, I missed this story when it came out. Yeah, you're you're correct. Can I just state for the record that my father has a 2017 Cadillac Escalade, and it could not be a bigger piece of shit if they made it that way intentionally. <laughs> It is one of the most terrible things, and everybody involved in making it should be absolutely ashamed of themselves. It's junk, and it was, and in the sticker on it was ninety seven thousand dollars for what is underneath a Silverado. I'm I'm staying out of that. And, I, I love all car companies. Bro, he bought it. I don't. It wasn't. There was no gratis. He bought it. <laughs> Fuck it. That thing was a piece of shit, and there was thirty k on the hood. 97 sticker out the yeah. door for 67 cash it and it couldn't be a bigger piece of shit mm. you know but i mean if you just look at that right no the, 200 kilowatt the, hours that's crazy <laughs> yeah i mean and, and so you know of course we in the we're ahead of everybody else in the world you know you know we're, we're, we of course are running away you know everybody that's in for the into the new green deal is running away from life cycle analysis right huh. because you know they, they don't want the bad answer that right uh, you know you can't you know you can't supersize everything <laughs> yeah and, right. and very expect, good expect that it's going to be sustainable right yeah like, oh, who, how could that possibly be no i want bigger 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 heavier 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 you know, more power, more power, more power, and it's all going to be clean and free. Like, no. <laughs> That's not how that works. Holy shit. What is that electric Escalade going to weigh? 8,000 pounds? Who knows? But that's literally like driving three of the average fleet, average internal combustion engine uh, vehicles in the EU, right? That's like, crazy. Hey, save, save the world, you know, triple the number of, you know, car equivalents you're driving per day. I'm gonna keep buying old cars, Kevin. We've Good got part. we've got uh, one question, I believe, from a fan that is uh, directed directly at you. We got a few more questions that are just general car advice, and we won't torture Kevin with that. But we're gonna give him the. What do you got there, Zach? For Kevin, um, let's see. Except none asked uh, Kevin, what were the best and worst aspects of Coda, and how do the business models of your current ventures compare to your prior outings? Well, I'd say the, uh, you know, with, with Coda, you know, there, and this was a time before I was really, uh, you know, fully aware of life cycle analysis. So that was a company that, uh, I co-founded, you know, in 2006, 2007 and was the CEO of, and, uh, you know, at that time I was looking and saying, you know, here are these big problems of energy security and, uh, you know, uh, you know, an environmental impact of vehicles, 
you know, let's and that, that also the battery company was it was related to this to Coda as a uh, joint venture. And so I was looking at how to fix that. So the idea of putting together a team that had a very focused mission that could get everyone to work hard and be very enthused uh, about, uh, I think that was the best part of that. Uh, it also, you know, for my company today, you know, totally invaluable uh, learning uh, uh, opportunity because, you know, I set up a, a factory to do the tooling and conversion of that vehicle from an internal combustion to a full uh, uh, battery electric vehicle. And, you know, all of the economics of tooling, all of the economics of setting up uh, stamping and body assembly line, you know, I learned and taught me not to do that ever again. Wrong. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you, in 2009, uh, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences came out with a life cycle analysis of electric vehicles that had exactly the opposite conclusion that I had thought it would, and uh, and I was shocked. And I remember standing in front of uh, this million square foot battery manufacturing facility. And if you put into YouTube, Gary Locke, who was the Secretary of Commerce at the time, and myself and Cody, you'll see we're standing in, in Tianjin in, in China with w one of the members uh, of the Chinese Politburo and the mayor of Tianjin in the world's first, you know, long before there was a, a, a gigafactory, right? Uh, this was the world's first battery megafactory. And I'm standing there in 2010. And I'm standing there thinking, you know what? I was so looking forward to this. I thought this was gonna be the change the world moment. And you know what? When I've really looked at this life cycle analysis model, it tells me I have to, number one, rethink things and not be afraid, not be a coward have the courage to rethink things and that I can never allow myself to be too tied emotionally to any technology or any brand. That's that a good lesson. Right. Yeah, that's a good lesson. And, I like that lesson. And so those are the lessons that I took away from that. Yeah. All right. That's excellent. Kevin, I would like to come visit you at work. <laughs> cool place. I would love it too. We'll have some fun. We'll yeah, have some fun. yeah. Uh, that I, I got to see everything you guys are doing down there, and I, and I need to I need to hear what that engine sounds like. You need to yep. pick up the control arms that are uh, printed. Are they printed titanium, Kevin? Or are they printed in Cano? Uh, I mean, they're either if it's a control arm, it's uh, it's either an aluminum that we call alloy fifty two, which is our own. Uh, own patented aluminum or it's titanium. But Dude, they're so they light. Up, it, was a, it was an aluminum one that's about 0.8 kilograms. It doesn't make sense. Well, that's crazy. It's like picking up your house key. Yeah, and then it, but, awesome. but it's you know as long as this like yeah, this yeah. Uh, camera stand, it's really nuts. That's like the opposite of the shit at my building. Yeah. My, I'm, I'm right. building a, a building, Kevin, and I have a, 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 a. We're using number eighteen rebar, which is an inch and a half yep. thick, and I I give a piece of it to people to show. They always almost drop it on their feet because it's so fucking heavy. So um, here, here, here's here's a little here's. I'll, I'll just give you this very short thing on the front upper control arm. Yeah, uh, the tack saw, right? Yeah. So, so you look at that thing, right? And you're cutting, you know, fifty percent or more of the weight out of something in the normal way that you'd manufacture it, which is huge, right? I mean, you're talking about suspension and, and chassis structure and you're taking out 20, 30, 50% of the weight and you're increasing the performance. The other thing is with our manufacturing system, you have the inputs, the, the hard points and keep out zones. Ordinarily, it would take, uh, uh, you know, engineers, you know, weeks to design something, get a, a, a sign off on it, then have, uh, you know, tooling or, or casting uh, uh, that's set up to manufacture it. And then you'd manufacture it. And who knows? That would be six, six to 12 months out mm -hmm. from, from the start, right? Mm -hmm. We put it into our machine. 10 hours later, you have a ready to print structure generated. You send it to the machine. And within 24 hours from the start, you have that front upper control arm and you put it on, uh, you know, real actuator-based uh, test rig, 
and you run it through 150,000 kilometers, accelerated uh, testing over a couple of days, boom, that's the cycle. That's yeah. pretty awesome. That sounds great. I got to come see all that. That sounds awesome. And you're in in, in California, in Los Angeles. Torrance. Right here. That's fantastic. Yeah, um, what what? Where can everyone find you? Is it what's the website, Zach? Is it Singer Vehicle? Uh, Just Zinger. Zinger. Uh, Zinger. dot com. Zinger. dot com. C z i n g e r. dot com. And then also look up Divergent 3D, which is the 3D printing company, and it's badass. It's very cool. And someone asked uh, if you guys were hiring, so I'm just I directed them to your careers yeah. link, which is just hr yeah. at zinger dot com. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Thank you for your time, Kevin. We're gonna uh, we're gonna send you off, so we're not you're not gonna have to get stuck answering what sports car you should buy for twenty thousand dollars, like we're gonna be doing for the next half hour. <laughs> uh, but uh, I would love to come visit you in Torrance and uh, keep. I hope you you and your family stay safe, and uh, and we will see you very soon. Thank you for joining us. Hey, keep, keep safe. Hey, great, good talking to you, Matt. All right, thanks, Kevin. You. Bye. Bye. All right, Kevin Zinger. That's that's that is very very cool stuff, man. That's bitching it's really really cool like it's just the way that they can create basically any shape yeah. like they need to connect two points right yeah. you need to connect a wheel hub to something yeah how do you need to do that so instead of having to like you know okay we have we have tooling built for an a-arm that we've been building for two to ten years yeah so if you're a huge company like you have to use that tooling because you've paid for it like yeah. as we know, building cars is hard and expensive you're never committed to a piece of tooling ever right. that's pretty gangster it's pretty cool when uh, when uh, he was talking, when Kevin was talking about the engine, Zach looked over at me and mouthed, "It's fucking crazy." It is crazy. <laughs> I mean, the nut, like I, you know, I well, you've seen it in person. One. I have. I've seen it in person. Did you hear it run? No. Okay. They were they were uh, finishing the touches on the two on the white and the blue car for mm -hmm. Geneva, and then Geneva got canceled yeah, because yeah. of everything, um, which is a bummer. Yeah. So, but it, I mean, it's it's really cool looking. I don't, I don't know what else to say. But these the videos on their website are real cars being driven. That's not CG, right? No, no. They have- That's they a have, real like, this video is, this of a real their, car being driven. I think like development car, okay. and they drove it on the street, and they took it to Laguna, and uh, okay. you know that's kind of what I know about it. That's but, sick. I got to fucking yeah. have a go in that. That looks, that looks incredible. Can you imagine putting someone in the back, and you're like, all right, and they- it's got to be such a different experience sitting behind someone yeah. going fast because you, you can't see Did as much. they put much. a screen in the back of the seat so you could see around the driver in the front? That'd be cool. If you they, had a I don't think they did, but that'd that's be a good gangster, idea. That'd gangster, wouldn't it? That's a really good idea. Yeah. Because they have screens for... For the, mirror, for the, the rear mirrors view mirrors and, and like, stuff. I saw the big tablet on the side. It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we will have to, we'll have to get some more and get some more of that. I have never heard of the no emissions methanol methanol from the carbon in the air uh, it's completely neutral that's crazy i've never heard of that before me neither I that's never, awesome yeah. i'd so much rather that than evs no emissions gasoline are you fucking kidding me no i know someone <laughs> so, you know there's always someone commented they were like well methanol is like really corrosive and you need a lot more of it per mile but like I just I like that people are thinking outside the two boxes right. that we have, which is like, well, we've been burning this fuel for a hundred and whatever years, yeah, and then the other option is electricity, which technically started in like the eighteen nineties for yeah. cars. So if there's a different way to do it, plus if you're pulling, it seems too good to be true. I hope it's not because you're pulling things out of the atmosphere that are caught that are greenhouse gases. Yeah, it's sick. Well, you're pulling, you know, you you pull them out, and you put them back in later. I mean, it's the same. That's pretty awesome. I don't know. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of stuff with carbon capture and all yeah. these things being developed. Like, cool. yeah, I don't know. The next eighty years is going to be very interesting. Yeah, if we live that long. Right. <laughs> uh, let's go to the people. We will go to the people. Um, While you're going to the people, I'm getting another water. All right. All right, cool dude sixty nine. That's an amazing name. It is eleven. You... Happy eleventh birthday. <laughs> How was the bowling alley for your birthday party? That is great. <laughs> or this is an old name from the AIM uh, days. Right. Uh, in semester chat. Um, he's planning on taking a road trip from San Diego to Omaha. He has two cars and he doesn't know which one to take. He's got a 2016 Focus RS with nope. PS4s. Nope. Or he's got a 2000 Land Cruiser with oh, KO2s. God. Jesus Christ. These are Definitely fucking the fo terrible options. The, the, fo focus, the focus. The focus. Yeah, the focus. The focus. The focus. The focus. Yeah. But, yeah. Because <laughs> the you could make the you the Land Cruiser would be interesting only if you off-roaded from like San Diego 
to Vegas. Like you could probably a Land Cruiser do that. would be fantastic if it was brand new. <laughs> it's an 18 year old Land Cruiser. It's probably not as comfortable for that kind of road trip. True, it, but and then after you get out, when you're not off roading, all you're doing is highway miles. Yeah, and man, the drive to Nebraska from Colorado. I'll tell you what. It's just like driving on an endless runway. I know. It's no good. It's not great in a Focus RS either, I'll be honest. But no, but it'll be comfortable and fast. I did 1,000 miles last year in the Lexus version of the Land Cruiser, and it was fucking nice. I mean, yeah. And it was brand new. Right. No, that being... No, no, All right. Uh, Never Wander said uh, he has a daily driver now, and he wants something rear-wheel drive for autocross and occasional track days. He's looking at MX-5. He's got about $20,000 budget. Mm-hmm. He's debating on um, an ND1 before the engine uh-huh. update and with a turbo or stretch the money for a used ND2. Uh, I I grand. I would have a problem advising somebody to put a turbo on a Miata on a new one like that because I don't know if that's like a proven system or not. I think Fly Miata does it they, with lots of yeah. success. If they do it, then I would probably trust that. But autocross, you don't want a turbo for autocross. True. You want the better response of the newer engine for mm-hmm. autocross. Yeah. Yeah. You could also look at like a used SS1 LE. Yes, you could. Or an S2000 or any manner of 86s with a Rotrex supercharger. Those are so cheap now. 20K for- gets you into a Corvette. <laughs> I mean, it, it gets you into a C6. I think you do that. Uh, I really do. Yeah. Because it feels... That has all the things most you car. need. Most car. It's the and most car. It's got car. all the torque for the for autocross, and it'll be more fun on a track eventually. Yeah, I mean, I, it's hard if you got twenty k. You know, a C six Corvette is going to be a reliable twenty thousand dollars sports car that you can work with from there. True, but you're starting at a at a higher level. The Miata will have cheaper consumables, which is good. But tires, I, I would go Corvette tires ND are expensive. Too. Yeah. yeah, just go the bigger engine. You don't want it. Yeah, Corvette tires are pricey. Um, Dominic Boyer just asked if we'll do a future episode with Hurt, and I mean the answer is of course. Like, yeah, I haven't talked to that dude in a while, but yeah, sure. I, I I gotta I gotta hit him up. Yeah, uh, I feel weird because I love. I every time I see him, it's nice. We hang out. It's he's fucking chill as hell. I don't like follow what the Hoonigan guys are like doing all the time. They're doing everything. I know they're doing like, everything all the time, yeah. but like I I don't I I feel weird because I don't like follow their content. He just built a. I think he just built an A86 that he put a fucking 240 engine in with a turbo or something crazy like that. I don't know. But he built, it be he, a rotary? He built a doesn't, he, doesn't, isn't he committed to rotaries? He is, but not in this case. I think he just wanted it to be done quickly. An 86 <laughs> would be very cool. They're fucking fun as hell. The 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 old one. Yeah. They're, real they're fun. rad. Yeah. Impossible uh, to find a decent one. Yeah. He he refurbed it a lot. Yeah. Like he did a lot of paint yeah. work and stuff. And it looks really sick. Yeah. Um, Hunter Haley asked, are you excited for adventure drives through the Northwest? Um, I entered and I hope I win the Omaze contest. Yeah. The Omaze contest, uh, the entries got extended. It originally was going to end April 24th. They extended it to, I want to say June 4th. So don't go all folks. Don't go all bad shit about how it's a fucking scam. It's not a scam. They there's every, every time we do an Omaze ad, somebody has to comment that it's a scam is I looked I looked into this because it sounded like a scam to me. It's not. Do you know how hard it is to get legal authority to run sweepstakes in not just all 50 states but internationally? That shit has to be above board, dude. Sweepstakes are no joke. Mm-hmm. Giveaways like that with like six figure cars and shit, that is so like, that's legit. That's I a legitimate think business enterprise. There's a movie called Quiz Show. Yes. From like the thirties. I mean no, 50s. the movie was made in like the nineties, but yes, it was John based, Turturro and yeah. Ralph Fiennes and, and shit. it was all about a quiz show game show on TV that was actually rigged. Yeah. And I think because of that instance, the law there's a lawsuit and now there's laws around yes. sweepstakes and they're very strict. They're they're extremely strict. And I think I think some people who say that it's as quote scam, they say, well, it's for, you know, charity, but only like, you know, fifteen percent of the total take goes to the charity. It's like, yeah, that's how like a lot of charities work. They have to buy the prizes. You know what I mean? They pay taxes on it. They it's it is what it is. Anyway, I forgot how we got there. Adventure drives, right. I am very excited. I hope it happens. It could go either way. I got the email this morning, actually, there was an update there, that is right now it is a go. Uh, there are a couple things that could cause it to be a no-go. Like, for instance, 
the border to Canada is closed right now. <laughs> which is a problem there's like there yeah. were a couple things that were deal breakers such as the border to canada or hotels not being able to to be open and accommodate us um that was those two were deal breakers and there was some other stuff that was like not necessarily deal breakers like certain restaurants would be closed or you know extreme social distancing or whatever like it's pretty much like a road trip people in their separate cars people in their separate hotel rooms like it, it we're gonna try to, we're really really gonna try to make it happen the safari rally unfortunately it wasn't canceled it was postponed indefinitely i guess um we're going we're fucking going they're, they're kept my deposit we're going when it happens i said as long unless it's in during adventure drives which i don't think if they're gonna postpone it it'll probably be further but um it, it, it'll be super awesome if it happens and it'll Good be trip. and it'll be rain checked and and postponed if it doesn't i'm sure i mean everyone who's doing adventure drives like wants to fucking go so. yeah the trip looked amazing yeah it's really super insane. sick so, i don't know if they i mean i don't i highly doubt anyone's gonna sign up for a trip road trip in july now but right but, <laughs> i don't know maybe rob's making deals i don't know <laughs> hit him up we'll it'd, be very, up. it'd be a little risky a little presumptuous but yeah yeah but i'm i'm excited and if and if it happens we're gonna go yeah yeah I got my my Beauty and the Beast mask. You see my mask, dude. Brother, your mask. This is hilarious. Does this. not. So I got this mask, right? Sense. My brother in law and his, and his wife. I don't I don't necessarily whatever their titles are. They uh, have a this coffee shop in Santa Monica called Blueies. Shout out to Blueies, and they're selling these masks, and they're like handmade masks, right? Here, get the, get a shot of the mask. I mean, here's, that's here's and and from more than a couple of feet away, or even even pretty close up. It, the mask looks like a stained glass window on a church, which I'm not religious in the least, but I just thought that was cool. And I bought the mask, and I've been wearing it around for a, a day or two. And then someone came <laughs> up to me and asked and said, oh, you don't look like a normal Beauty and the Beast fan. And I had absolutely no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> and as it turns out, it's not a stained glass window. It's a still from Beauty and the Beast. And if you look in one of the windows of the thing, look, there's like, there's, there's, there's Beauty like kissing the, the Beast. Amazing. <laughs> right there. And it's, uh, yeah, so that's, that's my coronavirus mask is Beauty and the Beast. That's incredible. <laughs> that's so, when you told me that, I looked closer, I was like, oh my God, that is Beauty and <laughs> the Beast really dancing is. and kissing. She's wearing a gown and everything. Yep. And amazing that someone spotted it yep. from several feet away and they knew. Like, yep. Oh, I have that. Yep. As part of a stained glass window. Well done. All right. Um, Adam R. asks how Christian James Hand is doing. I went to visit him. Oh, you did? I did. He had not left his apartment except for like a weekly grocery store run in like eight weeks. Or however, since, since March, you know, 10th or whatever. And I was like, yo, if I... Cause if I go to Bay Cities and get Godmothers and ride my scooter over to Hollywood, would you have a, an eight feet apart parking lot picnic with me and exit your apartment? And he said he and he said he would, and he did. Then I went over there and I rolled two mini joints, so we had a little separate joint. And then we had a little Godmother, and we had a little little socially distant parking lot picnic, and uh, it was actually quite nice. Nice. It was on the day that it was crazy hot it was like 99 degrees in hollywood Dude. and i rode my scooter riding home on the 101 it was 114 degrees it's like riding into a hair dryer. yeah and i had not drank that much water oh, i shit. got the sandwiches christian got us mexican cokes which goes great with a godmother i hadn't had a fucking sugary soda in months months and I was like, oh, this is good, but I really hadn't had any water. And I'm on the 101 into this hot wind, and I started feeling lightheaded as hell. And I got, I mean, I, once oh I got over the hill and the temperature came back down again, it was fine. But for like 10 minutes, it was, I was like inside my helmet. It was oh, bad. Oh, damn. Yeah. yeah that's hot. like, I might, you don't have to stop and just get water. And then and you'd cool open off. the, you'd open the vi and it got worse. Yeah, it doesn't help. It doesn't help at all. <laughs> The, bre your, the breath coming out of your mouth yeah. is colder than what's going in and past you. Dude, that's it was so brutal. brutal. It was brutal. But it, but it was a nice time to be riding scooter around selfishly. Um, and Christian is doing fine. Wow. Um, all right. Isaac Avocado asked, if we know anything about Elio Motors, 
The we, we've talked about it before the interesting three wheeled car. Someone else said that it's vaporware. But yeah, remember I mean, this. I don't necessarily think it's vaporware in terms of the fact, in terms of the way that. I don't think that's the right word. I think it's not happening. I don't think you should give them money. I think they're trying to make it work. They had some kind of vehicle that could be driven. I mean, I've seen these things driving, a couple of them anyway. I, they built at least one or two of them. Um, it's definitely not something you can buy. Don't give them any money. But that, does, but vaporware is the wrong word. There's a physical car in that photo, and it's driving on a road. So, yeah. But no, don't. It's it's. Chorchinsky or one of those Jalopnik guys has done multiple deep dives and it's basically like uh, you're you're not going to get a car <laughs> so I, I wouldn't no like you know if you go to their investors page on their website this was last updated June 30th of 2016 yeah I think that that tells you something about I mean mm -hmm. I don't know it looks like a fun that's about fun the last time cool I idea, heard but, someone mention Elio Motors yeah, as well yeah so, all right. Stranger danger. Um, and the last question is, can you do a review of the tracking TT01? It's a one, that doesn't make any sense, a one kilopound car with 220 horsepower? A 1,000 pound car. Oh, yeah, 1,000 One kilopound. One, 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 yeah, 1,000. I said it right, but I'm a fucking moron. <laughs> a kilopound. Wow, a kilopound. It's a kilopound. I mean, I suppose. That, that is the metric. That is how we would move into the metric system. Right, right. <laughs> Forget ton. It's kilopound. Listen, we're not doing no metric system. All right, we'll do a little bit of a gateway. Kilo pound? We'll do a kilo pound. Yeah. I mean, anyone, this, anyone who buys drugs knows the metric system. It's fine. Um, I, What is that thing called? It, it's is tracking. That tracking? TT. What a, that? Oh, track king. Track king, but spelled tra with. A tra it's spelled in one word. Yeah, man. Get Look how here. he wrote it. It's spelled with one now word with a looks, lower case. That K. looks a lot. Go back to the photos. This looks a lot like the EXR LV003 that is was the that was for sale. The EXR race series that they were selling the entire series, and you stick a different grill on these cars, and it was like Whoa. a Renault engine tube chassis car it looks like this i don't i mean this is a little silly race car it's just a little it's a little race car i don't know anything about it it has a very stupid name uh and it looks like you can make it look like a sort of a dtm car but it looks look now g give me uh get a, a picture of the of the white one the exr spec race car which looks a lot like that, which was based on a French car called a Mitjet, and I, it honestly oh, wow. looks like the same thing. Doesn't it look like almost the same thing? Yeah, like okay, so that's the EXR, uh, the LV02, which is based on the French Mitjet. It's like an A3 coupe kind of thing. Well, with it, a Z4 back. Yeah, it's it's they put different headlight and tail light stickers and grill stickers right. on it. But it, it, it's just sort of a, you know, fairly generic DTM-esque coupe. This tracker one, oh, wow, that track king, that's a terrible photograph. That is not a good photograph. That's a really it's actually a low-res photograph, too. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. That's all we know about it. Um, the rear window uh, is different. Like, no, look, yeah, look at no, the it's opening. not the same. Seeing them side by side is not the same. But it's a similar, it looks like a similar kind of idea. Vaguely DTM-esque tube chassis car. This one that looks pretty. Oh, center seat. It's like a little thing. Kind of. Center yeah, seat? I don't. I, I mean, don't I don't know. I, I that's not for me. You know, what this sure. looks like it looks a little bit like a Legends car. Yeah, but for an with adult. a modern body on it. Yeah. Yeah, it's your kind of left seat. I mean, I bet it's fun. I'd rather have a cross cart. But uh, yeah. Oh man. <laughs> a cross cart. Two hundred twenty horsepower in this. I mean, it's probably a good time. It's very unfortunate looking though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is. That's the best word you can use to describe Fend it. Fenders and whatnot do not look good. Zach, um, who's coming in the rest of this week? Do we? Do I know? My phone. I forgot who I booked. I can't even remember. I can't even remember who I booked on my own some, show. Some guys at Lame Let's Go Joe said, uh, asked if you've ever ridden a Super Motard because you said that the Morgan is a better drive home than a Super Moto. I've ridden a Super Moto before. Yeah, I'm I'm like a big fucking gorilla on a Super Moto. If they they don't really make Super Motos my size, <laughs> I, 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 they're cool. I totally get why you would. Um, is a Morgan better than a Super Moto? I mean. Obviously, you're talking about different things. The Morgan, you're a fancy person. 
No, women will not stop you on the street because you brapped your supermoto. Women literally will stop you on the street if you're driving a Morgan. And there is not a lot better ways to start or end your day than being smiled and waved at by a pretty girl on the street. True. It's the only car I've been in ever since since my DeLorean. But it's even better than the DeLorean. The Morgan is a good at getting girls. That's It's a shockingly good at that. Um, great. That's our show. Uh, tomorrow, we've got Misha Mansoor. Uh, from the band Periphery, Misha Mansoor is coming. I don't know if he's, he might come in. Maybe. We'll see. Or he might Skype in. I don't know. Uh, Thursday, we've got Randy Nonnenberg from Bring a Trailer. And then that's this week. Yeah. So we got Misha uh, tomorrow, the 12th, 5 p.m. Randy, Thursday, the 14th at 4 p.m. Uh, Bring a Trailer discussion is going to be very interesting. And Misha is a, he's a very talented musician and also a hardcore car person. He's really smart. He's cool. Um, all right. Thanks, everybody. That's our show, The Smoking Tire Podcast, powered by Shout Engine. Get your own damn podcast at shoutengine.com. It's easy. All you need is a microphone and connection to the internet and ideally something to say. Good night, folks.